We found the fastest growing town in Montana, but is it really worth the hype? Cue the intro. Throughout history, a select few places have experienced massive population growth in a remarkably short amount of time. These are the boom towns. Individuals with vision and guts put it all on the line to build infrastructure and a better way of life for these communities, changing the local economy and history forever. We are on a mission to find the next boom towns across America. At the edge of Glacier National Park, nestled within the northern Rockies of Montana, lies the city of Whitefish, a booming resort town with stunning hikes, mountain biking, world-class fishing, and a bustling downtown food scene. But its growth seems to have happened overnight. To better understand the town's future potential, we need to start with its past. Hunter, what do you have for us this week? Thank you, Austin. Yeah, so for thousands of years, Native American tribes, such as the Kootenai, the Ponderé, and the Bitterroot Salish, inhabited the mountains of western Montana. Now, if you listen to last week's episode, these tribes may sound familiar. Those are the same ones that uh, also occupied the area of Sandpoint, Idaho. Uh, if you haven't listened to that, go check it out. It's a great episode. Uh, it wasn't until the 1850s that fur trappers came upon these tribes. Uh, they were pulling a fish, a native fish species, out of the lake there. And can anyone guess what the name of the fish was? That's right, the white fish, uh, and thus the lake got its name, Whitefish Lake. For the next 30 years, fur trappers and immigrants passed through the area, but it wasn't until 1883 that the first permanent settler built a cabin on Whitefish Lake. And I want to pause there. Uh, Austin, last week you mentioned uh, that the fur trade seemed to be kind of like the initial industry in a lot of these Pacific Northwest towns. And that was really the case in most Western cities um, or frontier towns at the time. The fur trade really drove westward expansion, and you may notice that in all these places where there was a fur trade by like the late 1800s, it kind of just disappeared, and other industries took over. And I was going to ask you, I'm curious to know, can you guess why the fur trade essentially died in all these places uh, in the western U.S.? Let me think about this. The Industrial Revolution was in full swing. I would say that trains became a big deal. The railroad was growing at that time. I know it had, had begun. Sure. Uh, no, I don't, I don't know specifically, though. Why? Yes. I think you'll be surprised to learn that what killed the fur trade was the fashion industry. And uh, I'll go into detail about that. So up until the late 1800s, beaver pelts, other animal pelts were part of European fashion and fashion back east uh, in the eastern U.S. And the powers that be decided that fur was no longer cool. Uh, silk was mm. the new thing uh, for menswear, uh, women's attire, and it, it essentially killed the fur trade overnight. Um, I just thought that was a fun little side note that I wanted to throw out there because that's something you don't learn about in the history books. Well, that's crazy, though. You're right. In like the Great Gatsby and all the 1920s yeah. you know people flappers that you think of and all that they're all wearing silk there yep. no one's wearing fur that's crazy okay. yeah absolutely it just it just wasn't cool anymore and uh put tons of people out of business but that's the way it goes back to whitefish montana though i digress so not a lot happened in the area up until around 1904 when the great northern railway was built uh, it was built through what is now the city of whitefish uh, and that's what really sparked the initial development of the town. In 1905, the town was incorporated. Now, back then, it wasn't known as Whitefish. Whitefish was the name of the lake, but the town was called Stumptown. To make way for the railroad, they had to clear a bunch of trees, and it left a bunch of stumps behind. Uh, they eventually did change the name to Whitefish. Uh, for the next 50 years, the railroad and nearby logging companies really drove the economy. Like, that was it. Uh, but in time, the logging industry began to wane, and modern technology led to a severe downsizing of the railroad's workforce. The economy was on a downward slope, and things were not looking good for whitefish. So, what saved the town from economic collapse? Believe it or not, that's right, a nine-hole golf course and clubhouse was built in the 1950s, with another nine holes added in the 1960s. Today, the town boasts 36 holes, which is the largest golf course in Montana. And around the same time that golf was taking off, the Big Mountain Ski Area was developed, so skiing had arrived. And uh, today, that's known as the Whitefish Mountain Resort. 
So Whitefish had successfully made the leap from a humble railroad town to a golfing and skiing destination. And I will point out that the railroad is still in operation today. However, it has been just totally eclipsed by the tourist industry as the primary economic driver. And Austin, as you alluded to in the intro, Whitefish has just experienced this sudden surge in popularity. Like I, I'd, I'd never even heard of it a couple of years ago. And now I feel like everyone's talking about Whitefish. I think a lot of it has to do with disgruntled workers and families on these coastal towns on the West Coast. They're just fed up and they say, I'm moving to Montana. And Whitefish inevitably is at the top of the list. Uh, before we move on to the stats, I wanted to mention that this episode is going to be a Boomtown's first. While we've both been to Montana, neither of us have actually specifically been to the city of Whitefish. And I think that's going to be interesting for uh, how we handle this episode because we are familiar with the state, not familiar with the town. So we're kind of seeing this uh, with fresh eyes and a fairly unbiased opinion. So I think this would be good for listeners to see whitefish through our eyes as we uh dive into what the town is all about yeah definitely and it is literally the fastest growing town in montana and i'll go into where it ranks in the country as a whole but it clue here it's really really high so we felt we needed to talk about it and we also have friends who've been there so the total population of whitefish is 8713 uh, and the population growth rate is crazy. So it's 8.2%, which is within the top 15 fastest growing towns in America. So it is just going crazy. And there's some other stats that make that 8.2% look super small. So we'll get into that in a bit. And at the end of the episode, I'll talk about the projected growth rate because I think you'll find that interesting. The big question is, is the town worth the hype and will it keep its momentum? And so we'll get into that at the end. Part of the growth of whitefish is really due to the four season climate and local activities. The weather in whitefish ranges from 81 degrees in the summer to 16 degrees in the winter. So super nice in the summer. Spring and fall are actually really nice too, although those seasons are kind of short. And then the winter is hardcore. Uh, but because of that, they have nice dry powder for the ski resort. So we'll talk about that a bit too. In terms of age demographics, uh, this town has a combination of long-term residents who kind of lived there before it started getting really crazy touristy, and then middle-aged business owners, and then there's a new incumbent of outdoor enthusiasts that are buying vacation homes or second homes there, and so the average age is actually 44, which is way above the U.S. national average, and in terms of racial demographics, this is interesting because... Uh, as I mentioned, Whitefish has a lot of tourism uh, for a number of reasons that we'll get into, but the local residency racial demographics are primarily Caucasian. So 97.7% Caucasian, 1.4% Hispanic, and 0.3% Asian, 0.3% Native American. And on the political spectrum, Whitefish is actually moderately conservative. When, when people talk about Whitefish, if you're in Montana and people talk about whitefish, they think of it as being liberal, which I find really interesting. So compared to Montana, it is on the more liberal end of the spectrum because Montana tends to be a pretty strongly conservative state. And actually the county, Flathead County, is actually strongly conservative. So whitefish is more on the liberal um, side of that equation, but, but technically moderately conservative. Um, so... What I thought we could do here is get into our first of the sections for everybody who hasn't listened to Boomtowns. We talk about three things on this on this podcast here. We talk about would you visit, would you move there, and would you invest? So the first section is visit. And I'm going to start off with a crazy stat. So one crazy stat here is that Flathead County, which is led by Whitefish, generated the most tourist revenue in the state of Montana in 2021. The town of Whitefish itself had over 610,000 tourists who spent over $613 million total in 2021. It's just insane. That's and nuts. Yeah, that's over $1,000 a person, which is way above average, and we'll get into that a bit too. So the best season to visit Whitefish, as we talked about, is really year-round. So... I like to think about whitefish similar to maybe Vail, Colorado, or Whistler in Vancouver, BC, where the summers are sunny and nice, 
big blue sky is beautiful, but not too warm. So they're perfect for hiking, mountain biking, fishing, all that stuff. And you can easily do a day trip to Glacier National Park. It's right there. And that's a huge draw. The spring and fall are super nice. They're short. They're shorter seasons than the summer and winter. So it's kind of like a light to heavy jacket kind of weather, but it's just really beautiful during those seasons. And then the winters are hardcore. But again, because it's so cold and it gets cold quick, that precipitation freezes and it's dry. So it, they have world-class skiing. Like I've read different accounts saying it potentially is in the top 10 in the world. So um, the skiers out there, will have to tell me whether that is true or not. I haven't been skiing yet there, but uh, it, scientifically it makes sense with that dry powder. I grew up in New England and I got to tell you that was wet, sticky, icy snow and that was not in the top 10. So I just want to say it really depends on your reason for going as to which season you pick. And in the summer, even though it's a ski town, the summer is actually the busy, busiest part of the year tourism wise for Whitefish because of Glacier National Park. And so if you want to go in the summer, you have to book, get reservations um, for places to stay way ahead of time because it, it gets, gets crazy. So some top things to do in the area, you can ski or hike at Big Mountain, uh, as Hunter mentioned, and that's also called Whitefish Mountain Resort. And what's cool about that is in the summer, they have an adventure park, high ropes course, and they also have a super long outdoor, what they call alpine slide. You're in these little carts, kids can go in them, you have a little handbrake. And you basically use gravity to just go down the mountain around these twisty turns and everything. And uh, near our area, uh, Mount Hood has that same thing. And I've done that. And it's a, it's a blast. You can also enjoy world-class fishing on the Whitefish River and Whitefish Lake. Uh, Flathead Lake is also near there. And that's renowned, renowned for the fishing. Another cool place is the Great Northern Railway Depot. And so, Hunter, you mentioned that the railway came in. I think you said 1904. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So it's actually one of the longest on the West Coast. It's one of the longest remaining train depots. And it actually remains one of the busiest train depots between Seattle and Minneapolis, which is crazy because it's kind of like remote in Montana. Uh, but that depot has been operating for over 100 years now. But one of the most popular reasons to go to Whitefish again is Glacier National Park. And you can easily wake up get a cup of coffee roasted at Mountain Coffee Traders. They roast their own coffee in Whitefish. It's kind of a popular place. And then you can leave, spend your day touring Glacier National Park, and then you could be home for dinner or be, be back to your hotel room or whatever for dinner. And Whitefish has a bunch of five-star restaurants. It has some of the best restaurants in North America. So speaking of restaurants, I'm going to hit you with a few other facts on the visiting thing here. So you have to check out Cafe Kandahar. So the chef's name is Andy Blanton. He's a four-time James Beard Award nominee for Best Chef of the Northwest. And that's like the Academy Awards of cooking, if you're a, if you're a foodie. So he actually crafts cuisine that's farm to table. And he showcases a lot of seasonal and local ingredients. So I'm going to give you a little bit of of, of food porn podcast style here because Cafe Kandahar's <laughs> setting is in this beautiful boutique Kandahar Lodge, uh, which you can actually stay at. It's just a super cool setting. And they have sophisticated dishes like smoked opa belly with blood oranges, salsify and arugula, or succulent elk tenderloin with huckleberries, and Swiss chard and sweet, sweet potato. So if you're into that, like, Montana fancy food vibe. That is the place to go. Another great spot that's more friendly for families is a place called Lula's. So it's a laid back kind of family dining restaurant and you can go for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Um, but everything's made from scratch and from local ingredients mostly. And it's actually located inside uh, Whitefish's Grand Masonic Lodge. And What's cool about Lula's is they bring in seasonal artwork from the local community's artists. And there's a constant rotation of art. So it's just a really cool place to be. And then if you're looking for something cheap to eat, I scoured the restaurants. I spent way too long looking at the food here. And Piggyback Barbecue is one of the top places. It's really affordable. And they're known for their local smoke, smoked meat and their famous Montana dog, which is 100% beef hot dog topped with pulled pork, cheese, and Montana sauce. I don't even know what Montana sauce is, and it sounds good. <laughs> 
<laughs> so like definitely yeah awesome. definitely worth checking out <laughs> and in terms of places to stay uh whitefish is really a prime opportunity to find unique accommodations that fit into that wild natural environment that they have so the lodge at whitefish is a really popular place Log, local log construction, a two-story tall fireplace, and they actually have a giant taxidermy bear. And I grew up for a bit in Alaska, and I'd see those, and they're huge. Like, you don't think an animal would be that tall on its hind legs. And so if you haven't experienced that, it's worth going into. And the hotel totally screams Montana. And if you're up for an adventure, I found two crazy cool short-term rentals. So there's a really cool tiny home that's south of Whitefish Lake, and it has floor-to-ceiling glass windows, and it has a hot tub, and you just see the mountains and the trees. It's super cool. And if you're really looking for adventure, you have to check out the brand-new Base Glamp Whitefish. It was launched in July of 2022, and it's a resort where you can stay in bubble domes. These, like, plastic giant bubble dome things and they have heated wood stoves and they have hot tubs and it's like a whole resort so there's all these other people that are in bubble domes and you can they're not clear they're they're opaque and white and they have windows so like you can't just like see into other people's houses but you can you can walk between them so yeah hunter that's the visit section you know what are your thoughts on the stuff to do in the area i will i will say that whitefish again i haven't been there but I have been to other places in Montana and it doesn't anything like the other places that I went. I, uh, I've been in the Bozeman area, Butte, which are cool. They're nice. Um, but I wouldn't, these fancy restaurants that you're talking about and the bubble domes, <laughs> like to me that, uh, that that's just very new, I guess. Like when I think of Montana, I think of like kind of old school, um, v- still, still like a frontier kind of mm-hmm. place. Uh, even the big city like Bozeman, I, when I drove through there, it, was, it just felt like I was stepping back in time. And then reading this and hearing you talk about this in Whitefish, it just sounds like it sounds really cool. Uh, but it sounds totally different than anywhere else that I've been in Montana, um, with the exception of the uh, elk uh, and huckleberry. That sounds like the most Montana meal that totally. I could ever conjure up in my mind. Totally. <laughs> So that's awesome. And uh, I, I also, uh, I love the proximity to Glacier National Park. I haven't been there. I've had a lot of friends go there and I've seen the pictures. It looks absolutely beautiful. And they and it gets its name because there are indeed glaciers up there. Um, lots of cool hiking and um, place to ride bicycles, that kind of thing. Um, I've always wanted to go. So that does pique my interest there. Yeah. yeah. It sounds exactly the the, the geography and the that the stuff to do being the ski resort and the hiking and the biking and all that, like totally up my alley. That being said, you're right. It feels like a place where a crazy amount of demand went. And because a crazy amount of demand went, so did a crazy amount of money. And thus base clamp Montana bubble dumps, right? Like that yeah. totally sounds like, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't fit the Montana stereotype. And I'm not, who am I to judge? But I'm, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. It's just not what I would expect if I were to go on a Montana adventure. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And that's why I really like the analogy of like a Vail, Colorado in the sense of more expensive, extremely yeah. high class restaurants, kind of world class skiing. It really has that vibe, which again, you're right. It When I, I think of Montana, the places I've been, it's not that it's not beautiful in certain areas. It's just that it's more rugged than that, right? And so I totally sure. get what you're saying yeah. there. Okay, let's move on to the would we move there section. And so this will be an, a really interesting <laughs> section because some of these stats here are going to blow you away. Because of the vacation home and tourism-oriented nature of Whitefish, I just want to say kind of my opinion on this. It may not be the best place to move and raise a family unless you're somewhat wealthy that could be a scenario if you were retired and you had kids and you wanted to grow up, raise the kids there and such, that would be doable. Uh, but we'll get into kind of how the economy works and how much money you can make and what jobs exist and why that might be a little tricky. The number of people per household is 2.6. So you'll notice that's not a very high number compared to the U.S. average. And 61% are married and um, 25% are married with children. So it's not a, it's not like a suburban 
you know, raise your kids kind of place to move per se. And what's really crazy about this is home prices grew 56.6% in 2021. It's just mind blowing. Yeah. And the median home price is a million dollars. And that's for an average square foot of 2000 square feet. So the price per square foot is just crazy high. And what's really nuts about this is 70% of the residents own their homes. But what's really important to note is a lot of people own homes and are not residents, statistically speaking. And so what I think you have in this scenario is a lot of people who live there for a long time who own their homes, and then a bunch of people coming and saying, I want a vacation home here, it's beautiful. And there's no supply, and thus the demand is crazy high, prices get jacked up, and we'll go into some reviews that people have shared uh, from people who live there. And I think we'll we'll hear some consistency there. The average income of Whitefish per resident is thirty thousand six hundred and forty two dollars a year. So like basically thirty grand. And the median household income is forty eight thousand. And that's below the national average. And so an area with crazy nice restaurants, expensive real estate has this really tricky thing where they the actual individuals living there, um, and probably have lived there for a while, it, it could be quite a struggle. The schools are rated, the elementary and middle schools are rated um, 7 out of 10, not bad. The high school is rated 6 out of 10, uh, and that's not particularly high compared to the national average. I think it's like number 2,400 ranked high school or something like that. But uh, compared to the area around it, the counties around it, it's actually one of the better schools in that entire area. And so people actually rave about the schools and they have a very low population compared to the quantity of teachers. So there's a lot of attention that the, the kids get there. So with Whitefish booming almost exponentially too, this reminds me a lot of Sandpoint, the last episode we did, Hunter, where mm-hmm. it's like growing like crazy. The residents live there. Their traffic is worse. The housing prices are more expensive. They're not going to five-star restaurants every night. And there's this probably tension within the community a bit on on the trajectory that that's going. Um, In terms of taxes, I wanted to mention this too. So they're ranked 27th out of 50, one being the best, 50 being the worst. So they're basically in the middle. And uh, they have income tax, property taxes, but they have no state sales tax, which is cool. Uh, like Oregon on our first episode, uh, if you haven't listened to it, Bend Oregon, shout out, uh, episode one. And the business taxes are super business friendly. It's actually in the top five business tax state in the nation. Uh, the biggest employers, uh, Winter Sports Inc., which basically owns the resort and a bunch of other little resorts. And so for if you want to work in hospitality, that's the way to go. Logan Health is the big hospital system. You'll notice with a lot of these small towns with tourism oriented, the, health, the hospital system is one of the largest employers. I think that's been true for every single episode that we've done. And then Burlington Northern Railroad uh, also has, I think, 400 employees up there. So in a nutshell, the most prominent local jobs tend to be either in the hospitality industry or building infrastructure to support the areas that are growing both the resident and tourist population. And the unemployment rate is actually below the national average. So on the surface, economically, it looks really good. And I imagine like the tax receipts for the city of Whitefish are actually quite good because of the tourism and everything. But on the inverse of that, we have that classic kind of older contingent of folks who've lived there a long time who are now struggling. Any thoughts on that, Hunter? Yeah, the median home price being a million dollars, that is nuts. I mean, that's higher than any place that we've looked at Mm -hmm. thus far on Boomtowns. And I know for a fact, I've looked on Redfin at um, smaller towns in Montana, just a couple hours away from Whitefish. And you can get a decent little house for like 200, Mm -hmm. 300 grand. So the fact that the median home price is a million... Wow, that's really high. Um, Another thing I wanted to point out um, when it comes to moving to a new area, we've talked about this before. Like, it's really imperative to get a get get an understanding of what the people are are like there, what the culture is like. Will you fit into that culture? And I wanted to bring up uh, the fact that I did. I spent some time in Montana last year. I spent a few days there. 
and I was a couple hours south of Whitefish. So this is I'm speaking of my personal experience in Montana, not Whitefish specifically, but the vibe that I got interacting with people there was that they don't really like people Drew that are not from Montana. Um, I hope I don't offend anyone saying that because I'm sure there's a lot of really nice people in Montana and a very, a lot of welcoming people as well. But, but my personal experience, it just felt like we don't like tourists and we definitely don't like people moving here from out of state. It almost had the vibe of like, we like Montana the way it is and we don't want to change. And so to see whitefish just blowing the heck up and like you said, they, the infrastructure they're putting in, the bubble dome things, like that's just so not Montana. And I would be curious to know if people outside of Whitefish, other residents of Montana, but who don't live in Whitefish, I'd be curious to know what they think about how things are going there and the amount of tourists and new people that are being pulled in from other places. I can't imagine they would love that, even though the uh, revenue the state's getting is awesome. Um, now, I will say Whitefish is a tourist town and they're obviously capitalizing on the fact that they're a tourist town. So I would imagine if you go, if you move to Whitefish, they're probably going to be super nice to you because you're bringing money to the area and uh, you're probably not alone. If you're from again and you're moving there, well, there's probably a guy next door from New York. There's a guy from California, you know, so you're, you're not going to be the one guy that moved to town and uh, people are kind of ostracize you. Um, any thoughts yeah, on that, Austin? Yeah. So I was just in Idaho, this last weekend, uh, not in Sandpoint, <laughs> but uh, some we have some friends uh, and and family up there, so we went up there to see them briefly, and they were talking about Sandpoint, the last episode we did, and how it's considered to be kind of this exact scenario. So the locals who've lived there forever are now moving away because although the schools are getting better and the healthcare is getting better and all the infrastructure is getting better, the honest truth is their wages haven't gone up, so they can't afford to stay. And so then they move. And then, so there's kind of that dynamic going on. Also, that town of Sandpoint has trended more liberal. And that has brought a lot of, for me, cool things. Art, uh, awesome restaurants, tourist-oriented things, beautiful parks, all of the things that, you know, as a tourist, because I don't live there, right, I... I would like, but then on the inverse, like you're saying, the way of life is just changing. And, and similar to Montana as Idaho, I think the population tends to be more conservative and they, um, you know, even um, my wife's family members who live up there, yeah, that, that change is hard and can be very frustrating. And uh, I've had discussions with them on, you know, it's hard to stop really, because if everybody just decides white fish is awesome and they just come what happens is houses go from 400,000 to a million dollars instantly because the amount of demand is so outpaces supply and so that momentum is in the moment especially is very very hard to stop and so yeah i i would say from a moving perspective as well uh, shout out to my buddy max he has an office in whitefish as well as in uh washington and he's given me some insights on that. And he basically said it's growing like crazy. It's extremely beautiful. Uh, very much like a Vail, Colorado, Lake Tahoe, Bend, Oregon vibe. Uh, and I asked him about the moving there part. And he, he even said to me, he's like, I would have a vacation home there. But because of the things to do there, Basically, what he would want to do is go for two weeks in the summer and have a blast, hike, mountain bike, whatever, and then go for two weeks in the winter and go skiing, going on a skiing adventure. Other than that, he said it's relatively small, so it's kind of dead in the off seasons a little bit. And so that that kind of indicating that he wouldn't want to live there permanently full time because you kind of have this juxtaposition of a small town feel with a ton of amenities. I that are shut down other than a few months of the year. And so I thought that was a really good kind of feedback about the living there part as well. Should we go on to the invest section here, Hunter? Awesome. Yeah, let's so move on. population growth, 8.2%. Again, that's in the top 15 towns in America. It is growing like crazy. There's been a huge increase in tourism 
And as we've noted, if a place has a ton of tourism because of some macro economic event or a political event or whatever that, that drives this pretty much unsustainable quantity of tourism, it's not like it mean, it's not like it reverts down to what it was previously. The average is now higher than it was previously. And so now that it's discovered, I think that growth will slow. Uh, but it will not stop because it's a beautiful place that's been discovered. And the average tourist, as I mentioned, spends over $1,000, which is way above the average for a tourist location. And bear in mind, this includes people who are literally driving through, staying one night just to go to Glacier National Park and leaving. So this is equivalent to some of the most expensive places from a tourism perspective to go because there's so many great restaurants and, and tourist activities and uh, I lived in Hawaii, and Hawaii. this reminds me a lot of Hawaii, where it's like you go there, and it is one of the best life experiences ever, but it's pretty much impossible to find a place that's cheap to stay. Is that, that tiny home I mentioned with the glass windows and the hot tub, it's like 30 minutes away from town. Uh, it was 500 bucks a night. So just something to be aware there. Yeah. Wow. And uh, so I don't think it's going to slow because of its proximity to Glacier National Park as well. I mean, the demand for glacier, for, for national parks in general, the, the government is literally having to like, you have to reserve, I believe, to even get in online. And there's a certain amount of slots. And if you don't get the slots, you can't even go. Right? Yeah, I live, I live fairly close to Mount Rainier National Park. And this summer, oh my gosh, there have been more people on the road heading to the park than I've ever seen in my life. And we drove over the pass uh, a couple weeks ago, um, and you actually drive through the park, but we didn't stop anywhere. Uh, and we couldn't if we wanted to, because they literally had signs that said, like, this part of the park is completely full. There is no more parking. And this was like mm -hmm. nine o'clock in the morning. I mean, just absolutely nuts. So yeah, we're seeing that all over the country. Yeah, and I, I don't think that'll go away. It might slow down, but uh, people fresh air. And uh, the final thing I'm going to mention about the investing thing is I was I was scrounging a bunch of forums, and I found a bunch of people who'd recently bought homes in Whitefish, saying it was insanely hard to find electricians, plumbers, and landscapers, and that type of shortage is really hard to fill. It's not. Like you can train up an electrician instantly and they're quite good and they're senior and they're a journeyman electrician or something. It doesn't happen like that. And so from an investment perspective, I see a few opportunities here in Whitefish. The tourism has exploded. I do think it slows down a bit, but the average will be way higher than it was before. So I do think there is plenty of demand for services for the tourism industry, for sure. Also, any type of services for the infrastructure of the town, because it's not, this is not the last time that someone buys a mansion in Whitefish. I guarantee it. Because those people who bought their mansions, they're telling their friends and their friends might want a mansion next door. And so electricians, plumbers, landscapers, any type of service industry, I, uh, infrastructure service industry, I think is a really good business opportunity there. Uh, the final thing I'll mention is remote work is growing in Whitefish, um, similar to Bend, Oregon. So uh, services around remote workers uh, is also uh, an opportunity there. Any other thoughts on the investment stuff there, Hunter? Yeah, I was just going to say Whitefish is also quite remote. Um, I mean, if you think of Montana as a whole, it, the whole state is remote. Um, you got Bozeman, the big city, uh, and I believe there's an airport in Bozeman, but that's probably three or four hours from Whitefish. It's kind of out in the yeah. middle of nowhere, man. Would you yeah, agree? Is Billings closer. No, Billings, I believe, is in eastern Montana. I think Bozeman would be the closest major city. You're you're right about that. I almost wonder too if you could Spokane, Washington, or even like Coeur d'Alene. They they probably have regional airports around there. But to your point, um, I think that's also why that there's a lot of money spent there is because it's quite a commitment to get there. And so you're not just going to go for the afternoon to Whitefish, right? <laughs> so. Uh, yeah, I, I actually think it's really fascinating. So, Hunter, right. why don't you jump into the reviews from locals? Uh, I think we'll get some insights from that. Absolutely. Yeah, the first review here says, Whitefish is a great family-friendly community. There's a lot of activities for families. The outdoor recreation is the highlight of this town, in my opinion. It is riddled with hikes, mountains, lakes, streams, and so much more. The town doesn't get too hot or too cold, for Montana, that is. 
The public schools do the best they can to give each student e an equal opportunity and an excellent education. The community is tight knit and unique. Mm -hmm. That's really just saying a lot of what we already covered here. So I'm just going to go ahead and move on to the next review. I love whitefish, but it can, it can get congested, especially throughout the summer. Even though it's a ski resort town, summer is the busy time of year. If you don't ski, prepare to watch a lot of Netflix during the brutally long and gray winters. The prices go up and traffic slows down. The jobs are primarily in hospitality and land home prices are through the roof. Often homes are priced at twice the estimated value. So this is an interesting one because uh, this guy's got a point. If you don't ski, Montana has long and hard winters. And I I've heard about that in other places of the state as well. Like hunting is really big. If you don't hunt, there's like nothing to do in the winter. Stay indoors, uh, which sounds pretty terrible to me. Uh, Austin, do you have any thoughts on this review? Yeah, that's totally, totally the case. My dad grew up in Montana, and I do think that's part of the allure is if you want to live rugged in just honestly one of the most beautiful places in the world at certain seasons at least, there's very few places you can go to do that. Montana is one of them, and I... That being said, this guy also talks about the jobs. And uh, for we're, we're going to talk about other towns on this podcast. Boom towns! But uh, the, first few, the first few episodes we have done <laughs> have really been about tourism-oriented towns, or even Bend, Oregon has a huge amount of population. People work there, people live there, but they also have tourism. There are other places that are very suburban. They're, they're potentially suburbs of a major city, and they're just growing like crazy. But in the case of something like Whitefish, Montana, you really have this hyper concentration of hospitality jobs and infrastructure jobs. And that's kind of it. And so it is something to be aware of, again, in terms of moving there and, and what experience that would be like for, for the average person moving there. Okay, so as I do with every episode, I have calculated the projected growth rate uh, for 2023. And as I mentioned before, it was 8.2%. I don't think that's sustainable. Uh, also, the math says it's not sustainable because the average growth rate was 3%. And so as I did the math, 4.2% uh, is the projected growth rate. That is still within the top 50 towns in America, I believe. Uh, it's quite exceptional. I do believe that will continue because the tourism has accelerated. Those people go there, a certain percentage of those people want to live there. So I do think demand will outstrip supply for quite some time in that respect. So Hunter, let me ask you the big question. Would you visit Whitefish? Would you move to Whitefish? Or would you invest in Whitefish? When it comes to visiting, I would say that I would not visit Whitefish for the sake of visiting Whitefish. And what I mean by that is if I was planning a trip to Glacier National Park, I would 100% stay in Whitefish because of the proximity to the park. If I was doing a big road trip across Montana, I might hit Whitefish just to say that I did. But I would not I I would not personally go to Whitefish just for the sake of going to Whitefish because in my case, there's a lot of comparable cities that are closer to me, uh, whether that be in uh, British Columbia, Oregon, Idaho. Um, so no, I, I wouldn't go out of my way to visit Whitefish. But if I'm in the area, sure, I'll check it out. Would I move to Whitefish? I'm going to say no. Um, <laughs> number one, I can't afford it. <laughs> I don't have a million dollars. And uh, e even if, if I had a million dollars cash right now and I could just go buy a home in Whitefish, Montana, I don't think I would because I think I could get more bang for my buck in other uh, regions of the country. Because there's, there's ski towns all over, right? Um, for a million bucks, go to... Carolina and you can get a mansion. You know what I'm saying? So whitefish, probably not. Uh, would I invest in whitefish Montana? This, I, I would say yes, because it is blowing up like crazy. And assuming uh, your projected growth rate is accurate, it's going to continue growing. And to your point, they're going to, they're going to need things like plumbers and electricians and, um, and other, you know, things to draw in the tourists, restaurant, more additional restaurants. They already have quite a few, but more restaurants, um, just more fun things to do. Maybe um, hunting guides, fishing guides, that kind of thing. So if I was someone that um, 
owned a business like that, I think Whitefish would make a lot of sense because as people come in and buy these million dollar homes, they clearly have a lot of money to throw around. And that's a great opportunity for me as the business owner. Uh, so Austin, let me ask you, would you uh, visit Move and invest in Whitefish? I would totally visit there. I Doing research on Whitefish, looking at pictures, I want to go there. I have a huge fascination with places like Lake Tahoe, Bend, Whitefish, uh, Sandpoint was a little bit this way, uh, where you're in the mountains. Leavenworth, Washington is another place that's kind of known like this. And you're in the mountains, but there's freshwater lakes and there's mountain biking. Whistler in Vancouver, BC, people kind of think of in this respect too. It's like got everything I want all in one place. And I like really good food. And some of those places don't have crazy good food. And this place has awesome food. So yeah, I'm, I would be super psyched to go there. I I would probably go in the the fall or the spring because I think I could do everything I would want to do, but with less busy roads. That's my my hope, my guess, if I plan a trip there. Um, in terms of moving there, I would not move there. Similar to what I had said about Sandpoint in the last episode, I it's too far from things that I need, like a big international airport. Um, the, the job market there, although you could work remotely, um, is, is, is tough. And I did look at the amount of rain, uh, sunny days that they get. I think it's like 150 sunny days a year. And that's below what we get in Washington, uh, in our area at least. And so I don't love gray winters, <laughs> to be honest. And so I think just for me, there's aspects that I, there are seasons if I lived in Whitefish that I would be, feel like the luckiest person on earth. But the culmination of all of it is probably not, not my vibe. But from an investment perspective, places that have 56.6% home price appreciation in one year, places that have tourism growth that has doubled or tripled in one year, that is a huge momentum thing, and it will slow. It might be home price appreciation of only 15% next year, which is still extraordinarily high. It may be tourism that gets cut in half, which is still double what the average was prior to that. And so I think there's a huge misallocation of supply and demand in that area, and it will only continue to grow. Also, as Hunter, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, if you agree or not, but Montana is essentially made of Eastern Montana and Western Montana. The geography is drastically different between the two. Western Montana, I think it only makes up about a third of the state in terms of the geography being mountainous and tree and wet, uh, um, tree forested <laughs> and wet, wetter. And I happen to like that climate. And so <laughs> in terms of living in Montana specifically and places to live in Montana, Whitefish would probably be in the top five on my list. And from an investment perspective, just purely statistically, there is no other place in Montana that is growing like Whitefish. So those are my thoughts on visiting, moving, and investing to Whitefish. So I just want to thank everybody so much for listening to Boomtowns. And join us next week as we discover Seattle's fastest growing suburb. I make sure to bring a raincoat. It's going to be a wet one.